In history, injustice done to any group or nation can get them economic and technological compensation from other countries. This can help eradicate their poverty and create international empathy. China is one country that had widely publicized the injustice done to them in history. This helped them win international sympathy. America and Japan generously invested money and technology in China. As a result, China today has become a superpower. Another example is that of the Jewish people who were persecuted for centuries. Christians also persecuted them, but today they are protecting the Jews. How did this animosity turn into friendship? Because truth was accepted. Many museums of the Jewish Holocaust are reminders of the injustice done to them. Because of this awareness, the world largely sympathizes with them, and a power like America now protects their cause. If the truth about the atrocities done to Hindus was accepted, there would also have been museums to educate people. If the destruction by the Turks and Arabs in India was properly taught in history, then Muslims would have become the protectors of the Hindus. There would have been a cordial relationship and the world would have had a better understanding of Hindus. But leftist historians distorted that perspective. The Hindus provided shelter and protection to the persecuted Jews, but much of that evidence and history has been deliberately blurred. India's centers of learning and temples were destroyed. The Indian historians who wrote about those atrocities were called communal or radical nationalists. And the British historians who told the truth about the Muslim invasions were brushed aside as imperialists. Will Durant was neither communal nor an imperial Englishman. He was an American historian and philosopher. He was neither a friend or foe of India. He, with his wife Ariel, wrote stories of civilizations of the world in 11 volumes. He is one of those rare historians who is best placed to compare the history of India with that of other countries. He wrote that the Mohammedan conquest of India is probably the bloodiest story in history. From his words, we begin the ill-fated story of the destruction of India. The stories are so dreadful that some may be deeply disturbed. So we will narrate only the essence of that here. Wildrant wrote that the news of Indian cities and temples having boundless wealth of gold, diamonds and gems spread across the world. Hordes of Scythians, Huns, Afghans and Turks started hovering about India's boundaries and waiting for national weakness to let them in. For 400 years, 600 to 1000 AD, India invited conquests. And at last, it came. The invasions came in such a brutal way that there is no comparison of its cruelty in the world. Invaders demolished temples and idols, plundered wealth, burnt villages, cities and fields, slaughtered men, abducted and sold women and children, burnt universities and libraries, massacred teachers and students. For centuries, India endured a storm of brutal massacres, horrifying rapes, abduction and loot. Every cultural continuity is our shared memory. The invasions over thousands of years irreparably demolished many cultural continuities of India.
Yog is one of India's most ancient continuity. What an irony that Yog was valued and embraced by common Indians only after the success of asanas and pranayam in the Western world. Why the subject which was given by sages, rishis to Indians were so much neglected. It was an alien subject to the very sons of the great sages of India, like the Mughals, then British, who invaded India. They were molesting, raping women. So they had to go to remote places. So connection, we lost the connection. As we lost the connection, we lost the uh, Samskriti. At the time of Islamic invasions, Buddhism was prevalent in the northern frontier states. People were Buddha Parast, or worshippers, and made many idols of Buddha. Therefore, idolatry and Buddha Parast became synonyms. The word Buddha Parast became Bhut Parast. Buddhist monks became the first target of jihadis, since Islam believes in the destruction of idols. Renowned Buddhist scholar Rahul Sankrit Yayan writes, tonsured heads and maroon robes were the death warrants of the Butparas Bhikkhus. Within one and a half century of the arrival of the Turks, Buddhism was wiped out of India. The assault of the Turks is the main reason for disappearance of Buddhism from India. Acharya Nagarjun of Nalanda, Yogi Goraknath, and hundreds of literary references suggest that Indians knew about the technique of body rejuvenation. These kinds of secret knowledge were guarded and propagated only through the Guru-disciple tradition. Islamic invaders destroyed the centers of learning and human knowledge was pushed back by hundreds of years. Libraries burnt for several months. The Sharda Peet of Kashmir, the most renowned university of the Hindus, was raised forever. Kashmir is the crown of India. When the crown was struck, cultural darkness threatened the rest of Indian land. The continuity of culture makes a human being humane. Dhyan, meditation, is a culture. When the Dharma Yuga of Dhyan is annihilated, then the Kali Yuga of conflict begins. The caves where the Buddhist monks once used to meditate became the launching pad of the September 11th attacks in America. The world is one family and let noble thoughts come to us from all directions. The river valleys that once reverberated with these chantings became the valleys of terror. Mathura, the city of Hindu, Jain and Buddhist cultures, was pillaged and destroyed around 20 times. Countless people were massacred. This Yamuna River was colored many times with the blood of massacres in Delhi and Mathura. There was a temple at the heart of Mathura, which was so magnificent that people would say it could not be a man-made structure. The beauty and splendor of the temple was so stunning that it was impossible to express it in paintings or words. On seeing it, Ghaznavi wrote that if 200 million dinar were spent and the best of sculptors are put to work, even then it will take 200 years to build this. But soon after that, he ordered it to be demolished. Temples were loaded with gold, precious stones and pearls. There were diamonds the size of a pomegranate. The long caravans of loot extended for more than 50 kilometers. In the ancient Bhagavad Purana, the city of Vrindavan is described as a serene and picturesque place. Here, simple innocent people used to live life with nature. After its destruction, it was lost for centuries and could not be located. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, with his enormous efforts, rediscovered many historical places and reinstated worship 
and bhakti. But the lost glory of Mathura and Vrindavan could not be achieved ever again. Here is the model of the stupa made by Buddhist king Kanishka. Four pillars surround the dome. About 2,000 years ago, this was the most beautiful architecture of that time. If it was really 170 meters high, as claimed, then it would have been the tallest man-made structure of that time. After crossing the Khyber Pass, foreign travelers could see its golden canopy from miles away. The sound of its golden bells could be heard from afar, and this structure would give travelers their first introduction to India. A huge, affluent, nature-loving country, India. Today, the entire northern part of India does not have a single stupa or temple in its original form to remind us of its ancient splendor. Human heritage was desecrated most savagely. After destroying the temples, idols and idol worshippers, some of the conquerors used to dance in the Khankas. Today, it is stated as a cold fact that temples and cities were destroyed. But for the Hindus, it was their worship divinities that were mutilated, Archavatar. The sites that were discovered by the rishis and saints as the energy-giving centers were destroyed forever. With the destruction of the Vastu Purusha Mandal, or deity, the Vastu of the city was dismantled. And this devastation brought about the mutilation of the Vastu of the country. It was a gruesome attack on the culture of India. Until today, many Indians have not recovered from that trauma. These ruins are painful reminders of that rampant destruction. The one who tried to liberate Indians from that destruction was Queen Ahilyabai. Queen Ahilyabai was the lady who tried to heal the wounds of people. There's not a single corner of India that she had not visited to rebuild the broken places. But it was not enough. More than 2,000 big temples had been desecrated. In the place of Shikharas, domes were built. Idols were defaced relentlessly. When poetry, music, dance and drama all converge to give expression to human experience, an idol is crafted. With the destruction of idols, humanity lost many insightful experiences. The temples that once reverberated with poetry, dances, drama and debate were silenced forever. Thousands of dancers were enslaved and artisans were killed. The center of culture and the symbols of an extraordinary civilization came crumbling down. The period of destruction of the temples and the time of the disappearance of Natya Shastra is tragically the same. Babur once wrote, in India, foreign invaders plunder village after village, kill people, but just in a few years, the same villages flourish again in full bloom. Reverberating with song, dance and festive celebrations, how is this possible? 